Uh, Let's see. 668. D8. Yes. Yeah, oh, you do a good job of that. <laughs> How do you even do that? You sound like, uh, what is it, the, the groundhog and Winnie the Pooh? Yeah. What's his name? Gopher? Uh, I don't know. Probably. They don't have Whatever. creative names. Except for Rue. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Okay. Eeyore. That's Pen creative. Cat. Oh, let's do this. Okay. Somebody's going to find that really annoying. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Welcome, everybody, to episode number 68 of the Goulet Pen Cast, where fountain pens are still a thing. I am Brian Goulet. I am Drew Brown. And we're here from Goulet Pens to deliver this casual and informal, tangential and extraneous, superfluous and extemporaneous fountain pen show, where we talk about what's going on with the Goulet Pen Company and the fountain pen lives. In today's show, <laughs> we're going to be talking about cleaning our Lamy Safari grip sections. What are inkwells and how do you use them? And pens that make us go, wow, even as seasoned pen veterans that we are. And some other fun nonsense. But before we do, we want to wish you a happy Fountain Pen Day. Because that's the thing. Is that today or has that already happened? No, that's a thing. Today. Right now, as this is publishing, it's Fountain Pen Day. What? Yeah. If you haven't already heard, oh, Fountain Pen Day. Well, first, ta- first Friday celebrate. of November. First Friday of November every year. Um, it's been around for about a decade. And uh, it's completely just made up by the pen community. And we've had involvement in it ever since it came about. That is and, delightful. Yeah. Now it's a thing. How are you going to celebrate Fountain Pen I'm Day? celebrating by recording this video. There's no better for, way we can do this. We are, promotion of we are unifying of the community. We are celebrating <laughs> yeah. in our collective nerdiness. Absolutely. No, I mean, legitimately, like Drew and I are off, like literally right now. Because we have like life things going on. And, I don't. You know. He does. But I take time well, off whenever he does because that know. means I have fewer that's, meetings to go to. That's true. So there's less that's of an true. impact when he's not here. So I can just... Fair enough. But uh, yeah, we were basically like, okay, we could either do one pen cast like normal last week and then mm-hmm. skip this week, which was a, my original plan. And Drew was like, no, Brian, here is what has to go down. We're going to split it up. We're going to do two of them, half the length. And we've already failed because we did like an hour and 25 minutes on the last one. And now we're like, ah, we're not capable of doing an hour long one, but we're going to try. So we're going to move it along. And yeah. So anyway, if you happen to see this today or this weekend, I guess we're doing some sales. We have some new product launches and stuff happening with Fountain Pen Day. I don't have them nailed down enough to say what they are right now. But they'll be great. But check our site if you haven't seen it yet. And, you know, probably other retailers have things too. So whatever, just go buy some fun stuff if you're interested because you can probably get some deals. All right, let's check out some feedback. Okay, Conrad says, Drew. <laughs> You've got to talk about... Oh, Drew. I like that. It's like a... Drew, we got to talk about Brian's woodworking hobby, so let's talk about yours. You enjoy retro gaming. Have you ever dove into retro emulation, or are you more of a purist? What's your favorite retro console? Well, Conrad. I like that. What is it? The the Ivy and the Douche or whatever on the... Uh, Ira. Ira and the Douche. Yeah. I brought you the <laughs> so it sounds like that kind of voice. Yeah. Anyway, go ahead. Radio voice. That's right. Uh, thank you for asking, Conrad. I am a retro gaming nerd. Uh, mm-hmm. And yes, emulation is a big deal because while I do have all my consoles, hooking them up to an HDTV and actually playing them and storing all of the cartridges that I have and sw- switching them out, it's just a pain in the butt. Sometimes I do it just for fun, but really emulation is the way to go. So I like to make mm-hmm. Raspberry Pi computers. I made one for the office here that we installed in an actual arcade cabinet, That's which sweet. is super fun. That's sweet. And I have a small one at home that is just plugged into my TV with a couple wireless um, uh, uh, controllers. One thing I did do was take an original uh, Super Nintendo controller and then replace the board in it with a Bluetooth compatible board. So I have an original controller with the original buttons, but plays with Bluetooth. So you get that. That's pretty cool. You get that original feeling. Um, any purist will say like, oh, there's a lag, but I don't mind it. I mean, I can adapt, but uh, I definitely do that. So while I do display some of my cartridges, I have most of my cartridges in storage and uh, I kind of cycle them out sometimes to say like, okay, which ones am I going to display um, and which ones are going to be stored? So I've cycled them out twice, not as often as I planned on doing, hmm. but uh, obviously like the gold cartridge Zelda, that's always up there. And I have a couple of other, other displays too, but um, yes, uh, my favorite retro console is definitely the Super Nintendo. Um, that's the oh. one I played the most as a kid, and those games age really well. Yeah. Uh, in like Atari 2600, those games didn't age super well. Nintendo, pretty good. 
after Super Nintendo, when you get into N64 and PlayStation, those don't age super well either. Mm. The Super Nintendo and the Genesis, I'd say, have aged the, the most well. Right. Sure. Um, so I think it was something about they didn't try to be realistic. They knew what they could do. Mm -hmm. They did it well. And you can still play them just fine. Yeah. So, yeah. Very Thank solid. You. Thank you yeah. for asking. Yeah. Well, uh, Brian, mm -hmm. this man, fun fact. One of the few, actually the only owner. I, I do own a retro gaming console. The only owner I've ever known who had an Atari Jaguar. Yes, and an Atari Lynx as well, the handheld N I game. never knew anyone that had those. Yes, but, my, uh, my dad. Your dad was kind of on the bleeding edge of uh, He tech. was like really into technology, yeah. yeah. And like, uh, yeah, long story short, Atari had a, a string of bad luck. And uh, the Jaguar was a total flop. And they never really developed any good games for it. So it was a very powerful console that had no games. And then it basically sunk the company. So I don't have it anymore. I wish I'd hung on to it because now it would be like a total oh, like I didn't hang on to any of my thing. games. I yeah. had to rebuy it was garbage everything. at the time. Yeah. My mom probably was like, oh, I, can I have, can I give Carol from work's son your old Nintendo? And I was like, oh, sure. Nintendo's lame. Yeah. I've got a PlayStation now. I will say the Jaguar, if you look it up, the controller that that thing had was like nothing else and has like nothing since. Didn't it have like a keypad on it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And it was massive. It was like holding a laptop in your hands. <laughs> the Lynx was massive too. It was like really long. The Lynx was huge. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it was like a Game Gear. You remember the Sega Game Gear? Oh, yeah, of course. It was like that before the Game Gear was a thing. Six AA batteries in that beast. I think it was a monster. Yeah. And it would consume them in like six hours. Well, like, the Game Gear had six. I don't know how much the Lynx had. Oh, I think it was either six or eight. It was yeah. something crazy. Oh, yeah, it chewed through it. But Anyway, yeah, I could talk cool. about retro gaming all, all, all day. Thank you, Conrad, yeah. for allowing me that. Um, Neil says, Drew, that is one good looking beard. You look quite distinguished and you should keep it. Smiley face, J, 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 J. What's the J's all about? Uh, he's very Oh, is passionate. that a beard on the smiley face? That's what that oh. is. <laughs> is it? I mean, it's a patchy <laughs> looking beard, but I guess that's what that is. No, this was for this was for <laughs> Halloween, which we'll talk about a little bit later, but uh, yeah. it's going. It's it's going to be gone. Are you like reaching that point where you're oh, like, it's yeah, driving me nuts. Can't wait for it to go. Cannot. Yeah. I hate it. Yeah. I hate I can't it. Really also, my wife hates it. it. Yeah. I don't uh, mind the way it looks. It just, it it's super uncom uncomfortable. Yeah. You probably need to like grow it out even more yeah. to get past that like itchy, annoying uh, phase. I don't want to. Because that's what I hear is you got to like power through that. And yeah. then after like six weeks or so. I'm then, sure yeah, I could then also find a way to enjoy beer, but I don't want to. No, nah, beer's gross. Like why? I, I've no. tried to enjoy beer and it's just gross. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't want to. No, I'm sorry. So, yeah. no, it's going to go. It's gar. <laughs> <sighs> anyway, what you got going on? You oh. can, you can pull off a beard though, I will say. Oh, thank you. Uh, okay. Caitlin says, whenever Brian talks about Ellie, I just imagine Louise Belcher from Bob's Burgers. Have you seen that show? I have not uh, seen that she's, show. She's so the I'm one, afraid I don't get the reference. She's the but... one that wears the bun, the purple, the pink bunny ears. Okay. She's just very headstrong, very like. Ellie often wears headbands with the ears on them. To what? Like cat ears or whatever. She'll wear them to school. She'll wear them when we go out to eat or whatever. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it happens on the regular. Dude. Yeah. She like puts all kinds of outfits together and yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I've, I haven't seen a ton of Bob's It sounds Burgers. like I, I probably need to see this show. It's I've pretty it's good. good. I've heard it's, it's pretty good. good. Yeah. Um, but uh, Louise is like always like she outmaneuvers adults a lot just with her plans and oh, schemes. That and, sounds like Ellie. But she's still got a little girl mentality. So all of her very clever plans and schemes are rooted in just absurdity. Yeah, but that's she, fitting. She, she, she executes them like a master tactician. Okay. So I can totally see where Caitlin's coming from. Yeah. 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 Kind of like, uh, kind of like, uh, oh gosh, come on. Macaulay Culkin, the movie. Oh yeah, Home Alone. Home Alone, yeah. yeah, like that. Yeah. Like masterfully executing ridiculous kid things. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah. That's a little more mischievous and like violent. Right. But, you know, <laughs> in the same vein. Yeah, Ellie's, Ellie's kind of like that. Nice. Um, yeah. Uh, okay. I will have to, I'll have to check out Bob's Burger. Uh, and then Jeremy says, all right, Brian, milk or dark? Oh, because you did mention- In relation uh, to chocolate. I feel, yeah. like I, I feel like I mentioned that in the last one, but I'm, I'm an all milk. I mean, I'll, I'll eat any chocolate. Mm-hmm. But it's always like in priority order. Sort of so it's like when it comes to food that I really like, I am definitely like a, I'm gonna eat the thing I like the most first. Oh, you're not gonna save the best for last guy. No, because I'm gonna eat whatever. I'm gonna eat it all anyway. 
<laughs> so okay. But we probably, probably milk? it stems from I love my sister, but she would like pick food off my plates. Oh, so one of it was those. a little bit of like of a defensive mm. maneuver. So it's like, you know, if I you know, my sister's three years older than me, and she would just like I mean she's wasn't trying to be malintended no, or anything. I'm an older I'm an older brother. I did the same yeah. thing. I'm like if if my if there are two things and I want one, I'm gonna try to find a way to make my little brother convinced that he likes the one I don't. It's just yeah. I wasn't, there was no evil intended, but mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And my sister, she's like kind of a grazer, you know? So she just kind of wanted to try everybody else's food and she would just like take I it. never did that. But. Yeah, that's kind of just like her jam. I yeah. love her, but you know, that's that was just like my weird thing yeah. as a kid was just like, do not pick food off my plate without asking. You know, anybody that does that now, I'm just like, no. Even my kids do that now and I'm like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> you don't do that with your dad, you know? Uh, but anyway, yeah. So, uh, yeah, if I have like, I don't know, whatever mixture of milk and dark chocolates, yeah. I'm, when, when are you in that situation? Right, so but we'll, it's like, like a, 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 well, I, I would say when you have like a assorted chocolates, like Forrest Gump style or whatever, oh, oh. but you don't always know what those are. What about those, um, but, those lint truffle balls? Oh yeah. So you've got white chocolate, dark chocolate, milk chocolate. Yeah. Your, your hierarchy is milk first. Milk for sure. And then those red ones. And then ooh. white or dark. The milk on milk. Oh, dark. Definitely. Dark above milk. white chocolate so is not really last. chocolate. Okay, no, no, no. Absolutely, I like white chocolate for what it is, but it's right. not actually. Okay, so there's that, no cocoa that, in that's, that. That's at the bottom. Yeah, but I still, okay. I'll still eat it. Yeah, yeah. I love all those lint. I'll still eat all of those lint over balls. any non-chocolate candy first. Right. Like I'm all about some chocolate, but yeah, I like milk. All right. But then I also like milk with stuff like milk chocolate and peanut butter, mm -hmm. or milk chocolate and uh, uh, mint, like ooh, chocolate peppermint. Right. That is a strong combination. We did, we did mention that. Yeah. But dark chocolate with like sea salt, also phenomenal. Oh, yes, absolutely. But pretty much like anything that's a chocolate related thing, I'll always pick milk over dark. But usually what happens in our household, Rachel likes dark more, but she like grazes like, uh, I'm trying to think of something that eats so slowly. I can't think of anything, but I am like ravenous, especially with chocolate. I will dig through the house and find any <laughs> chocolate, chocolate chips, like in the baking chips. Like I don't even care. Like if it gets to that point, I Just will. Any sweet morsels. I will find it. Absolutely, I will find those things. So yeah, basically, what happens is whenever you get like whenever like Christmas time or birthdays or whatever, like our parents or something they don't really buy us stuff but they're like right. oh here's some like chocolate bars or whatever and i'll get a milk and she'll get a dark she'll eat like one square after like three weeks i'm still saying i've consumed mine in five minutes right and then i'm just like i'll just eat all her chocolate because it like <laughs> gets like chalky on the outside and i'm like what are you right. doing what are you doing okay with so this and is there, like, is oh, there i a, forgot it was there i was like how is that even possible is there a chocolate That's thing you all really hate oh, i'm trying to think of like this. a little bit of cadbury cream egg I'm all about those. Really? Okay. I'll do those. Yeah. I'm trying to think of like, is there something that like has a really disgusting inner thing, but it's still chocolate. So you still eat it regardless. I've never encountered something that has, I mean, if it's like, if the chocolate itself is gross, right? like not a good quality chocolate, yeah. I will not be as happy about it, but I'll still probably eat it. You know? What's your, what's your favorite non-classic Hershey kiss? Um, probably the Hershey's with caramel is pretty good. Mm. Those are pretty good. Peppermint for me. Peppermint? Yeah. Those the are the ones with little. Candy oh, you're talking about like the white chocolate peppermint. Yes. That's what it is. Yeah, yeah. Those are good. Those are pretty good. I like those. Cookies and cream is good too. Mm. Right. There's no wrong way to do a Hershey's kiss as far as I'm you concerned. Could probably, I could probably ask you a lot of chocolate questions for. I could talk about chocolate it. the entire episode because <laughs> I'm a fan. Anyway, we'll move along. Y'all know enough about how much I like chocolate. If you send some to me, I won't hate it. <laughs> Don't, don't, send don't do that. It's not a solicitation. He's not asking for chocolate. I'm not asking for it, but I would not throw it away. I'm not asking for it, but, but don't. <laughs> Sorry. I don't know how to, I don't know how to say that yourself. without making it sound like I'm asking people to send me chocolate. Don't send me chocolate. But if you do, I won't eat it. I, I will eat it. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my gosh. Okay, let's move it along. We got some new stuff to talk about. All right. I got a couple of things. You gave me all the expensive stuff today, Drew. Lucky you. Um, Conklin has 125th, 125th anniversary pen. Just think about that. Hurly murly. That's so many years. Dozens <clears throat> of years with extras added on there because that's not a it's not a multiple of 12. <laughs> I don't know why I phrase it that way. Anyway, they're doing a Conklin Nozak. So they've done a Nozak before. This is a completely different Nozak than what they did before. 
Uh, Nozak is like a model that they had a very, very long time ago. So they're reviving that um, in a new way. So that'll be coming in November. It, this is definitely more in like the limited edition and it's an all metal pen, which is, they've done that with some of the um, Crescents and some other various things, but uh, doesn't have the same vibe as some of the other Conklins. So it's very different. These ones are actually made in Italy and um, they have like a single twist, like fast filling piston filler. I have no idea what the filler is gonna be. I know it's gonna be unique and new and different. So I got to see a sample of it. And basically it's like, you basically do like one twist and the whole piston just whew, goes up. So it's like a, cause you know, normally you gotta like twist it a mm -hmm. bunch of times. This one is like single single twist and the whole thing is up. So it'll be like a pretty fast filling. That freaks me out. I mean, it's kind of a novelty of a little bit. It's not like super essential, but oh, it is well. interesting. It's kind of a new thing. And it's got the word gauge on it and some other things that Conklin's done. So I don't know, very interesting. Um, you have a gold nib, super nice. So yeah, if you're interested so in that. So Conklin with a gold nib, that hasn't been done yet. With a gold nib. Um, not, not since we've carried Conklin. I'm trying to think if they have done, they might've done some like limited edition stuff that we never carried. I think they have done some of those. And the price is gonna be up there too. It's like, yeah, it's it's over a thousand MSRP. So it's up there. But it's very different. If you're a Conklin fan, you wanna collect some stuff, this one is interesting. And there's some cool colors too. Uh, also, kind of along the anniversary thing, Pelican. Celebrating 40 years of the M800, my I, I really dig the M800 size. That's like one of the more comfortable sizes. I mean, I like the M1000, right? Real, but M800 is like a nice sweet spot. So um, we'll have that coming out in November. I don't have a lot of details on that, but uh, you can check it out once we get on the site. Um, one thing that we uh, will probably have by time this publishes is a new product called the Endless Creative Block, mm. and it is a uh, notepad for you know, all intents and purposes, with a rigid backing made by Endless, which makes really, really, really nice paper. Mm -hmm. If you've ever used any of their um, notebooks, you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, so it's a tear off, you know, kind of a desk pad, smaller than like a pad you would lay something on, but convenient enough for you to you know tear stuff off. So um, not a ton different than like a uh, tear off, you know, pad, uh, but it's horizontally oriented. Definitely something mm -hmm. that does not exist in our offering right now. So yeah, it's we kind of hard to describe because it's like we don't have a lot else to compare. Yeah, it we to were pretty excited to give it a shot though. So yeah. I'd be really curious to see what you think of it, and uh, I'm curious to see how it sells because mm -hmm. it's not every day that we get a paper product that's actually different than another mm -hmm. spiral bound or you know staple bound notebook of some kind. So yeah. when something does come along and it's different enough. Feel like we should uh, give it a shot, or we owe it to yeah. you to tell us if it's worth it or not. So tell us either by vocalizing it in the comments or by buying one. That will let us know. Um, but it definitely is interesting. And speaking of funky filling mechanisms, Brian, um, oh, yeah, the Diplomat Nexus is in the coming soon territory. So um, uh, it may arrive by the time this publishes. Um, but either way. It is supposed to, it will be Diplomat's first piston operator, or internal filling mechanism pen that we've carried anyway. Um, okay. The, uh, um, the, the ZEP was a cartridge converter, right? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, first internal filling mechanism pen that we will have carried. Um, yeah, definitely thing. something new. Mm -hmm. And I'm really eager to give this thing a try. Like the Conklin Nozak, it's going to have a um, allegedly unique, filling mechanism, an internal yeah. one, so. I got to see this one, I got to see a sample of this one too. This is a while ago. Did you ago. see it operated? Yeah, yeah, it was operational. Um, so it's interesting, it's, it's, it's sort of like an eyedropper filler, like the filling mechanism itself. They said it was based on piston technology though. Well, so yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll need to kind of like refresh myself and see. I'm my definitely hands again. curious, very curious. Yeah, but what is, what is really interesting, particularly is like the cap mechanism. Like basically there's, the grip can kind of like, shift when the cap is closed and it kind of closes off the pen at like you would if you had a uh, vacuum filler. So it's got a very large ink capacity, more like an eyedropper, Whoa. but it kind of like seals off the chamber from the, the nib when you cap it. So it's kind of hard to explain. We'll definitely have to like show some visual stuff. Well, it's on um, our coming soon it's, section. It's pretty unique and interesting. It's it's a little bit hard to explain, but we'll we'll get into yeah, it. Yeah, check it all out. Um, all the stuff is on coming soon. You can see pictures. We've got multiple colors of most of the things we've mentioned, except for the endless creative block. Um, definitely worth checking out though. So if you're curious and you want to be notified when they're back in stock, if they're not launched already, we are recording this in advance. You can sign up to be notified. Um, or if they're out of stock, you can still sign up to be notified. So 
check that out and you'll just get an automatic email whenever they do pop into our inventory. There you go. All right, there'll be more stuff. Go check it out on our new arrivals and coming soon on goodevents.com. And let's do some Q&A. All right, Drew, a little compressed segments. That's right, one. we're only doing three questions this week, but they will be good ones, I promise. Oh. All right. I don't know if you should make such promises. Well. We'll do them. Yes, and if they're not good, we can blame people <laughs> like Ambrogio de Milano. There you go. So... We are don't going blame the question. Don't blame the person asking the questions. We want people to ask more questions, Drew. Let's not berate them before uh, we even answer I'm, the question. Maybe I'm just encouraging encouraging them to hold themselves to a high standard. Oh, now you're judging everybody who hasn't even contributed. I believe yet. in them, though. Oh, I do. Okay, I believe in there them. There you go. Back I believe pedal. in Ambrogio. All right. All right. All right. <laughs> um, Ambrogio asks, "Are they? Oh, sorry. Why are Safari grip sections so hard to clean out? Presumably the Lamy." Safari. So yeah, I would assume that's the one I'm aware of. Um, are they hard to clean out? I mean, would you say that they are? Um, I, I, would I would say, say I would say that sometimes maybe. I don't I wouldn't say like universally they're like one of the more frustrating ones, but I, I could see scenarios. No, I've definitely seen in in owning an All Star, you can see through the grip section, and okay. they're, they're, it's pretty easy to see when there's some stuff left over there. There's kind of a, there's a there's a bit happening in yeah. there, you know. It is a complex feed, I'll say that. It is, and that's actually part of why I wanted to answer this, and we'll show a little close up here. But basically, um, my technique when I'm cleaning the safaris, it's actually like the safari is one of more of my go to pens mm -hmm. for when I'm doing like when you record some ink stuff. sampling and stuff. Yeah, when we're doing ink sampling and I'm changing out a lot of colors very rapidly, uh, the safari is actually more one of my go to, partly because this pen. Um, it's pretty common. A lot of people are familiar with it. The nibs are pretty standardized. I can swap out the nibs when when writing it. That's not that's kind of ancillary to the question. But basically, it's a cartridge filling pen or converter. So I use the bulb syringe when I'm cleaning it out, which fits kind of nicely in here. You got to push it in a little bit to kind of because you know you got this little this little extra ness happening here. These little wings or whatever you want to call them. Um, so if you kind of cram that in there, and you got your bulb syringe filled with water. Basically, you just kind of you can kind of hold this a little bit. You push it through. That usually cleans it yeah. just fine. So, like for me personally, doing the converter over and over again Too is much. super annoying yeah, on these Lamy pens. This bulb syringe is the absolute game changer. So this alone will probably be enough for you. But if you need to go a little bit further, you can technically disassemble these pens. Mm -hmm. It is tricky though, and we have other videos on this, but I'm gonna kind of show you here. First thing I'll say is if you just fill it with water and just soak it, just or just drop it into a cup of water and let it soak for a while, that'll clean up any old dried stuff that gets in these. Um, and so that usually is enough to take care of it. But if you do wanna clean it out thoroughly, um, I'll do this, do this at your own risk, but basically you can take out the feed. It's in there pretty good at the onset. So I'm like sort of working it. You gotta be careful with the wings because they can be a little delicate. I'm using a Goulet grip here, just a little rubber grip. And this is a new one that I've never taken it out yet. So it is yeah, one, my, a bit of work. The ones that I have, I've done over and over and over again. They yeah, out. once you do it the first time. You don't even need a grip eventually. Yeah, but yeah. A brand, brand new ones are difficult. But this, that's why I picked this one is because it is brand new and I wanted y'all to see me struggle a little bit. Oh man, it really is a doozy. You can see I've gotten it out there a little bit. Uh, do you have any tips, Drew, for how to do this better than I'm doing now? I bring, I bring it closer to my torso so I can get more leverage. Yeah, I'm trying to keep it in the frame, though, so it's like I'm at a little bit of an awkward angle. Well, you can always do that and then bring it back. There, there we go. go. Okay. So I got that out of there. So if you look at this feed, it's got a lot kind of happening in here, right? And there's actually like a couple of pieces. So like this little piece here, it kind of, to me, I don't know, it looks like a Star Wars like vehicle of it some does. kind. It does. So there's a lot happening in here. And you can see there's a couple of channels in here. Actually, really good lighting, Drew, good job. Um, so the ink is traveling from the post feed all the way here through these channels underneath this little thingamabob. I don't know the technical term for what this is. And then through here, and then the nib actually mates up to right here. So the slit of the nib is gonna end up right here. So oftentimes what I find when these things get really kind of clogged, it's because there is junk like in here. If you got any type of like shimmering or pigmented ink, right? Especially if it's had a chance to like dry out in the pen, this, in is, my this is where it's going to cause you problems. In my experience, this is the only 
nib that actually has two pieces to it? Um, probably. I mean, I think there's like two pieces inside like the pilot feeds, but they're usually like kind of glued together. Yeah, it does have a rod it, that goes through. But it doesn't, yeah, but it doesn't like separate out like this quite right. the same. But I don't know, feeds are just, they're amazing pieces of engineering. But, you know, in order for the capillary action to work, it needs a very constricted space. But if it gets clogged with anything, it can cause you problems. So if you end up in a situation, I won't say don't do this every time with your pen because it, it is kind of a pain. And you can definitely damage the feed. And because there's no, like, there's not much to grab onto no. with this part here. So, like, when this thing is in the pen like that and you're going to have a tendency to want to grab the wings like where the where the the nib wings will fit onto the side yeah, of the, the feed. rails. If you bend or break those at all, your, your nib's, nib's not, not going. It's on. not going to fit yeah. on anymore. They don't sell feeds separately, so now right. you're into either like a warranty thing or and you then might of have course to get a new reinserting is a whole another ball of wax too. Well, that's the other thing. So if you find yourself in a situation you're like this pen is just not getting clean, and you got to do it. So okay, you want to put this thing back in. So I just I put the nib back on, which is nice because it kind of sits on there and, and mates nicely. You got to put the nib, the feedback in a very specific way. Yep. And this is one of the most common mistakes that people make is they put this in the wrong way and they get it stuck. And then it's really, really hard to get it out without damaging it. So the thing about these grips on the Safari and the All-Star for that matter, they're sort of triangular. So you have these like two kind of indented parts and then the bottom part is more rounded, right? So this is basically intended for your two fingers to hold and then the rounded part is the bottom. So that's your kind of your guide for just setting yourself straight. You can see the you can see the channel right there. Yeah, so if you look, that at the bottom there. So this is again, you've got your triangular section here at the top. So the bottom where your basically third finger would normally go, that is where the bottom of the feed has to mate up. And this you know, like the rails, I'll guess I'll call it or whatever the heck this thing is, that is going to slide into that section on the bottom of the grip. So when you go to insert it in, you put it in very kind of gently, and you can use the nib as sort of a rough guide too. If you see the nib is sort of lined up like it's supposed to, you kind of like rock it back and forth a little bit without giving it any real force pushing it forward. Kind of rock it back and forth until it just like really slides with very, very little effort. If you're if it's sliding like that with very little effort, you're doing it right. If you're like off a little bit and you feel like you're having to force it, at this point, you're doing it wrong. Stop, pull it out. Oh, see, it's already getting a little bit stuck. My nib pulled right out. Okay. You want to get it back to where it's lined up right. There you go. And then it goes in and then it'll sort of click in when you get, like if you've gotten it in this far with this little effort, you, you're doing it right. And then you push it in, it kind of clicks in place. Pop, pop. And then you're good to go. So. If you do need to clean the whole thing out, you can use your toothbrush or whatever, use a you know, cotton swab on the inside of the grip once you have the feed out. That'll really get it thoroughly clean if you find you need to do that. But I would just try to maintain it to the point where you don't need to do that on a regular basis. But at least now you know how. And you know, it's a Safari. It's not like the most expensive pen in the world. So like, don't be totally freaked out. But if you have like a limited edition Safari that is irreplaceable and now it costs $150 on eBay to get that color, maybe don't experiment on your dark lilac or whatever. No. Or your orange one or whatever that is irreplaceable to a degree. Um, try it on your one that's like the charcoal or something that like you probably have that um, is easily replaceable. And uh, there you go. So um, it's really not that different than most other pens. I think maybe just because there's a lot going on in that feed. It can be something that happens, but those feeds are the same on basically all the Lamy pens. So everything that's about the uh, can 2000. Yep. There you go. That's what I got on that one. All right, Drew. Tell Caitlin, me something. Caitlin Swigart, frequent flyer here. That's right. Asking questions. Thank you, Caitlin. Uh, inkwells. What are they? How do you use them? That's a great question. Uh, and we don't talk about inkwells a whole lot. We have not talked about them a ton. We no. talk about them here and there, but we're not like featuring them on yeah. their own so much. So we have a number of inkwells available in addition to just empty bottles you can buy and use as inkwells. Basically all of our ink bottles that we use to create ink samples, we also list them for sale. So if you wanted to just buy an inky bottle for whatever reason, um, you can have it. Yeah, that's uh, the most economical way to go yes, for sure. Yes, that, that, that is an inkwell at its very basic. Mm -hmm. It 
a bottle of ink that yeah. or a bottle that used to have ink in it. Mm -hmm. um, so one that we have is this one right here, the Twisby Diamond 50 Inkwell. I'm going to yeah. show you exactly what's going on here in a second. Yeah, that thing's um, been around for a minute now. It has, yeah, and they're still going strong. Still going strong. Uh, its cousin is the VAC 20A bottle, which I'll show an image of. Um, that one is specifically for the use of the Twisby VAC 700 and the VAC Mini. This one that I'm holding is for use with pretty much any pen, but mm -hmm. more on that in a second. Um, and then you've got, the those are, um, well, this is more of a traditional inkwell, just a bottle of ink with some additional features. Mm -hmm. um, and then you've got items like this. Uh, this is the Peniter Pen Filler, and it has a uh, compatriot or competitor in the Visconti Traveling Inkwell. These are meant for more portable ink filling purposes. So it is a reservoir of ink with a cap that you can remove, and then you would take your pen and put your pen down into it, just like that. Mm -hmm. It's staying in there because it has a rubber gasket that tapers, so it starts wide and becomes more narrow as it goes down into the filler. So regardless of the diameter of your grip, it'll eventually hit a point where it meets friction and stays in there. I don't have it pushed down too far, but you can see that it's not going anywhere. You mm -hmm. can actually see the nib poking out right there. Yeah. So once this thing is full of ink and you have it down in there, all you need to do is just invert it. And now all of the ink that's in there is going to be surrounding the base of the grip section without getting your grip section messy and disgusting. And you can get like a super full fill because you don't have oh, to yeah. deal with air bubbles or anything Especially like that. Especially vacuum filling pens, like this is the way to go. Absolutely, this, this is a great thing. The uh, one I'm holding here is on the more affordable end uh, compared to the Visconti version. Viscontis are, you know, they definitely like feel like more durable, higher yeah, quality. Yeah, th this is thing, like gonna get you the job done. If you mm -hmm. want something that's very going to look though. good in your pen case next year, Visconti, the traveling ink well from Visconti mm -hmm. is gonna do that job. Um, and in addition to that, we've also got a brand called Ink Miser, which we never talk about, but is super cool. That's true. They've got two products, one called the Intra Bottle and one called the Ink Shot. The Intra Bottle is an insert that can go into Noodler's bottles and some Platinum bottles that essentially turns your uh, used or using ink bottle into an inkwell. And Obviously, any bottle is an inkwell, but the, what this does, it's a cup with holes so that when the ink bottle is turned upside down, those holes fill with ink, turn it back the right way. That cup is now full of ink from the holes. And if you've got like a half full bottle of ink that's hard to get your pen down in there, what that cup is now allowing you to do is to fill from uh, the top of the bottle rather than trying to figure out how Super in the world handy. to get your pen to the bottom of a half empty I bottle. wish more ink companies would do that in their bottles. Yeah. There's a, like a couple that- There do, are a couple. Um, but it's very rare. Platinum does it with um, some of their bottles and Namiki does it with the two colors that yeah. they have as well. Yeah. Um, so and, yeah. And the Twisby Diamond 50 has it. Uh, yeah, so the Twisby Diamond 50 um, does a couple really cool things. So this bottle can be used just as a plain old inkwell. If you want to remove this, you'll see that it's got a little rod here. What the heck is that? But if you wanted to ignore that, you could discard that and just put the cap back on here. And it's just an inkwell that can be used with any pen. As Brian- A little insert thing, yeah. Yeah, as Brian mentioned. So that's the same concept as the um, yeah. ink shot. So you'll see that it's got holes there. And when inverted, those holes will fill with ink. This cup will also be filled with ink. And there you go. So pretty standard inkwell there. You don't have to have a twist Elegant. B to use this. And the VAC 20A bottle does the same thing. You can remove an insert and just use it as a cup full of ink. That is probably prettier than your bottle. Mm -hmm. um, but if you wanted to um, get the full, I guess, benefit of your Twisby pen, you can put this in here and you'll notice it has a little straw here. That is to get to those hard to reach spots. So with this top cap on, there is a little uh, nipple there. And with a Twisby pen, you can actually take the grip section off of your Twisby. Not so, all versions of Twisbys, but what well, you can do it no, on like the 580, the, 580, the Mini. Yeah, basically, um, yeah, the 580, the Mini. The uh, classic, I think. I think? Yeah, I think the classic. 
Um, no one has a classic, so it's fine. And then, right. <laughs> and then this actually plugs right in to that nipple. Um, yeah, it just fits right on there. Right. Let's call it a post so we can stop saying nipple. Um, <laughs> and then. Uh, well, so try not to right, say anything about it. Right but now. Like, I mean, know. that's what it is. That um, is the technical term for it. Yeah. So once that's there, you now have attached your pen yeah. to that metal straw that reaches mm -hmm. to the very bottom of the cup. So without inverting, you can get a totally full fill that way. So that is pretty cool. Yeah. Um, and I believe, Brian, this post can also fit a standard international converter. It can, yeah. So if you don't have a Twisby, you can still use this cool Yeah, there's straw. basically like two steps on the post there. The wider one, you know, fits onto the actual like pen if you remove the grip off of it right. and the converter will fit onto the really thin exactly. part. And the VAC 20A bottle is essentially the same thing. You take the grip section off of either a VAC 700 um, R or a uh, VAC mini and then install that, screw that actually, they, those thread mm -hmm. um, onto the uh, VAC 20A bottle. Those however, lack the straw that this one has. So those will need to be mm -hmm. inverted. But once that's done, you get a ultra satisfying, completely full fill on your vac pen. And uh, if you have a vac filling pen, the vac 20A bottle is not a crazy expense and it will really enhance the value of your vac filling pen, uh, in my opinion. I think that it's, it's a great accessory. So, yeah. Um, and also a great gift. If you know somebody that has a vac pen and doesn't have one of those, it'll be, a, it's, a, it's a fun purchase. Yeah. For sure. There you go. Um, that about Solid. covers it. Yeah. I think you pretty much covered all of it. Good Equals. Job. All right. All right. You got one right. more for me. One more from Sousa.Jesse. Ooh. What pen made you go wow after you were already in love with fountain pens? Hmm. It's a good question. I like that question. Uh, I would say I still get wowed on a pretty regular basis. That was my thought when I saw this question. Like I was thinking like, shh, like, Okay, what really wows me? But what it's, it's pen? different different things. I would so so I've got a complex answer, I guess. Oh, really? Um, you know, last week, no, two weeks ago, we unboxed the Naminki Emperor Elephant. God, that's a showstopper. That pen wows. Mm -hmm. You know, it will pretty much wow anybody, no matter who or how long you've been into pens or whatever. Yeah, you're not ready for it's, that. So there's a lot happening on that. But, you know, I don't want to give the notion that like a pen has to get bigger, more elaborate, more expensive to wow you, even if you're into pens and have a lot of them and all that kind of stuff. Honestly, like a really nice color of pen that kind of hits me just right will wow me. Price be darned. Um, like the Sailor Christmas pudding? That is an example that Drew was wowed by that <laughs> pen. No, no, no. But like the Coeco All Sport Iguana Blue. Oh yeah. That pen, I was like, wow, That's... that color nails it. Yeah. Like, I can't really explain why, just I like that color, it just hits right. Really like that one. Um, when we did our Sailor Northern Lights pens, Rachel and I, we picked a bunch of samples and once we kind of put it together and got the actual like sample pen, it was like, wow, this is cool. There's a lot going on there. Very cool. Uh, Twisby 580 Iris the like iris effect of oh, wow, it. You're giving good examples. Right? Yeah. So it's all like, these are really good. Yeah. And like these are, I mean, these are all, yeah, there's a mix of of prices and stuff in here. And but none of these pens that I'm talking about here are like that. I mean, these are all basically existing models of pens. I wasn't the know, iris is like, a great example because I was not ready for that. Right? I never I never even thought that I'd we even saw pictures like of it before we got it in yeah. and then once we got it in our hands we were like wow yeah this and like the nib with like the iridescent oh that's like all I'm thinking of I'm just thinking about the nib that, but that I mean, like even like the the clip and the center band like just the yeah that well I mean I had too. seen stuff kind of like that before so in my mind that didn't okay like, but then I saw the nib I'm like wait what? yeah like, well, it all works together for me you man know what I mean? that nib just it's all awesome. total show stuff yeah. yeah so it's like you know, we can still be wowed by, but you know, some of it's maybe little things like that. Yeah. Where somebody is not into pens, could they really distinguish that pen from, you know, a regular Twisby? Like probably, but you know, maybe that's not the first thing you would notice necessarily. But um, so there's that. Um, honestly, like I'm just still very impressed with all these pens, inks, all this stuff. Um, the design, the technology is still just really fascinating to me. But I think for me, like when particularly pleasing colors and materials are used, that's when I tend to get wowed. Or when there's like 
a theme that's just like really, really on point, you know, um, like, you know, um, uh, I'm trying to, I'm trying to think of something specific, but like the, um, well, you got your arcade carpet thing there. We created that. So it's hard to say, but like Drew came up with that design. I was like, wow, that looks like arcade carpet. And that wows me a little bit, you know, just cause it's like fun and interesting. So I don't know. I find, I can find a lot of different things to get excited about with different products. Yeah, it's not like, difficult you know, for either of us to get excited about things. We are pretty excitable. Yeah, but I don't know. I guess maybe some people would be less wowed by these somewhat simple things, but I don't know. To me, it's it's all just kind of interesting and fascinating. The fact that fountain pens still exist kind of wow me. Yeah, it's And the fact that like people are into them and we have this great community that like literally just kind of wows me every day. So, I mean, my baseline for being wowed, I guess is, is Low, high, whatever metaphor. I don't know where the metaphor is on that one. Low, baseline. No, my baseline is high. I don't know what I'm trying to say. I'm easily wowed. Um. So one one thing I thought about was like, when do I fall in love again with fountain pens? And that mm. I, I could think of a couple times this year where that happened. So hmm. I had sent my custom nine twelve off a year ago. Um, it took a year for it to get finished. I was getting some Urushi work done on it. Some some lacquer on my favorite pen. And when it finally came back, I was like, oh my gosh, like mm. this is a custom pen now. I have like a custom pen made for me. Like, oh my God, just mind blowing. And I have had a hard time putting that pen down because not only it was already my favorite pen, that's why I sent it off because it was just, an, it was another black pen. I wanted it to, because it was my favorite, look special. Mm -hmm. So it was already my favorite writing experience, but now it's just like I have a brand new connection to it that I, had no basis for comparison to before because I'd never mm. had a pen like that. So that just totally changed the game for me. Mm. And then this year also, I acquired two pens that I've wanted for a long time and just totally fell in love with them. The Pilot E95S and the Pilot Stargazer. Yeah. And I had wanted them for a long time. I acquired them this <laughs> year uh, through help with the kindness of others. And I have not been able to put them down or stop talking about them. And... So this year, I'd say those are probably my three biggest falling in love again moments mm. with fountain pens. Yeah. Because just the kind of hyping these things up in my mind and then having them arrive with me and then still surpassing my mm. expectations, like just, just marvelous. And the fact that the hobby can still deliver on me over hyping something, it is just amazing. Cause that's true. I've, I've just, I found the same thing myself, like rediscovering something that originally wowed me when I pick it back up and it wows me again. I'm then wowed by the fact that I'm still wowed yes. by the thing that originally wowed right. me, <laughs> I get which that. is like a new, newly experienced wow yes. compounded on an original wow. Yep. Yeah. That's pretty cool. And I've had, it's happened to me just revisiting old pens that I haven't written with in a long time. Mm -hmm. Like for for a, a video recently, I just inked up a, a Lamy um, Safari or uh, All Star that I had a 1.5 nib on. I'm like, oh my gosh, these 1.5 nibs are so amazing. I was just like, <laughs> why don't I use this all the time? And I think I, I'm like, I've got all these much more expensive pens. Sure. And I'm just, I, I need to stop sleeping on the standard Lamy calligraphy nibs. I like know. that 1.1 and 1.5, those nibs are so good. They are. I love them so much. Yeah, and I, I so now I'm like, oh my God, I need to always have at least one all-star inked up at all times. Like, cause, but then I'll find something else and I'll find something else. It's like, there's no shortage of things to get excited mm -hmm. about. Yeah, absolutely. Pilot Parallel, that nib, that continually wows me. Every time I pick up a Parallel, I'm like, why don't I write with this all the time? The rest of the pen is so butt ugly. It really I hate is. everything about it. But man, that nib is so cool. And every time I pick it up and write with it, I'm like, wow, the technology and just the design of that thing is amazing. I and just the writing recently, experience is phenomenal. I just recently told you, I was cleaning one of those recently. And so the, the Pilot Parallel has two parallel plates, right? That's the nib. Yeah. And then it's got a feed so that the, that plate, that square plate is sticking out of. Mm -hmm. That, what looks like a plate, is actually attached to two long it has, it has tails, essentially, that run the entire length of the mm -hmm. feed, and you can see them kind of poking out the back of the feed. I never saw that until yeah. just recently. And then I'm like, it blew my mind. And I'm like, this is so, like, engineering-wise, this yeah. is such a unique nib and feed situation. Yeah. And just, wow, that's so impressive. It's not just two squares sandwiched together. It's a whole inner system. Man. I think for me, and kind of what we're getting at a little bit is like, 
as we know more and more and deeper about these pens, yes, we're wowed by like the design and the technology and just the innovation. Cause like, I don't know, my experience having spoken with more and more of these manufacturers, like basically nobody's getting into making fountain pens because it's like a quick and easy retirement investment or it's like just seemed like an interesting thing to do. Oh, it's it's like, yeah, basically everybody making fountain pens is doing it because they're passionate or there's heritage there or something with their, you know, lineage or something, some deep rooted passion thing. So you see that passion come through in different ways. So I think that's like, it can manifest in different things for me, depending on the, the pen and the manufacturer and all that kind of stuff. But like, I'm continually wowed by how that passion like manifests physically in the products. And then the deeper, like we both have experienced this learning, like how the things are made and the handwork involved in certain aspects and the trial and error to make some specific aspect of a pen, you know, new or unique or different. You're just like, wow, that is really impressive how much went into that. And maybe even like final product is like, it doesn't seem as flashy, but just knowing like what it took to get there. Yeah. You're like, wow, that is really impressive. You know, so I don't know. Yeah, just trying to I, wrap your head around it all. Just I think for me to flip, to, to kind of wrap this question up, it's actually, it's the opposite of what you would think. I'm actually more wowed the more I experience and the more I know about these pens and who makes them and the products and all that than I was even originally because I just, I appreciate everything about them so much. 100%. More. Yeah. Completely Probably agree. a better way to phrase it than like, oh, I'm easily wowed. No, I think that there's so many things to be wowed by the deeper you get into well, I think this curiosity, hobby. a natural curiosity, I think allows for the opportunity to be wowed more. Yeah, that's a good way to phrase it. Yeah. So there you go. That's what we got. So light on the questions this week. Um, we're not gonna do a spotlight or anything. We're gonna move it along, but we do have some nonsense to talk about. So let's move on to what's happening. All right, I know you super care about this. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. I'm ready. Game of Thrones. I'm all pumpkins left here. I House. finished all the candy corn now. <laughs> all right. It's all pumpkins. Dig in. That's <sighs> <laughs> all that's left. I got to. Um, Game of Thrones, House of the Dragon. There's no good way to eat these. How do you eat these pumpkins? Like the candy corn, I have like a process, you know? Go all in, man. No, that's too much. <laughs> I even I have my limits, Drew. Uh, no, you don't. Like, do I eat the stem first? Like, that's not gonna put put a dent in it. There you go. Enjoy. Ah. Uh, <laughs> I know it's the same candy as the corn, but it's just too much. <laughs> now I'm like left with this weird <gasps> lump. <laughs> anyway, it's like all wet from my slobber. <laughs> Gross. Game of Thrones: House of the Dragon is over. <laughs> the series, the season has concluded. Okay. Um, what is that? <laughs> what do you mean the season is over? The, the the you know how TV shows have seasons? Yeah, it has it is ended. They named the season. No, it's the TV show. <laughs> the series. Yeah. The season is like one year of the episodes, yeah. right? Yeah, essentially. Yeah. It's not on anymore, right? Like you're doing the. I'm lost. You're the. You're like listening to the audiobook, right? No. On CDs. No, this is a show. Oh. <laughs> Oh, I'm confused. I was thinking of your CDs, like you no, finished like I'm still, I'm a still, chapter or something? No, no, I'm still listening know. to that. Um, the current audiobook I do. I clearly know a lot about this. The Game of Thrones House of the Dragon is a prequel series on HBO that takes place 200 some odd years before Game of Thrones, the television series. Okay. Yes. Where is this prequel happening? What for, What is this? Is this, is this an HBO a series? Yes. HBO, okay. Yes. But the original was an HBO Correct. series. Okay. It's a prequel series. It's a prequel. Yes. Like the three Star Wars yes. remakes they did after the original. Yes. Okay. But a whole and that worked out great for them. So uh, they were like, let's follow that model. It's kind of like it's kind of like what uh Breaking Bad did uh in akin to Better Call Saul. Okay. Prequel series. Fair enough. Yes. Um, I've actually seen those, so I know what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, there you go. It's the same thing. Yeah. Um, it is over. It is concluded. Okay. It was basically one long prologue to a greater event. So now I'm like, I really, really can't wait now. So <laughs> I'm a little sad. Okay. But it was good. It was very dark, like visually couldn't see anything. I feel like that's a thing now. It's Why so are hard. shows doing that? I don't know. I couldn't see anything. I watched Ozark and the whole time I was just like, 
What yeah. the heck is happening I here? Couldn't see it. Well, it's all, Oza, Ozark, it's all dark. Ozark, they could have turned on lights if they wanted to. I'm right. like, at this point, I'm like, for the right, aesthetic. Sure. I, I guess I'm like, all right, you're in a castle, you got some flames, but I know you could do better than this. I cannot see. I want to see what's going on. I couldn't see Jack. Not getting man. any younger? I could not see Jack. And most of the time, I'm watching stuff on my phone, especially stuff like that. Like I'm not watching it on a TV with my kids coming down and asking oh, me sure, to sure, suck sure. bugs out well, of their we, room. We do, <laughs> we you do. know, like I can't watch. Like yeah. we do this after stuff, after you know? Archer goes to bed, obviously, but yeah. Um, he doesn't come down and ask about. Well, you got like a basement, right? So you got like. No, no, no. Not in our current house. No. Our old house had a basement. I haven't basement. been to your current house. No, you haven't. Oh my gosh. No. Uh, no. But anyway, that's over. Um, so uh, we're just. Literally, gonna... as you're sorry to interrupt. As you've been talking about everything going on in your house, all I can picture is your old house. Yeah. I realize I have no point of reference. No. For anything you're talking about, but no. much like everybody else. So yeah. I guess I'm just along for the ride. Okay. Yeah. No, I haven't seen your new couch. You haven't. Like who? Know? I don't even. Don't it's a even couch. Know. Who cares? Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> All right, but uh, so anyway, um, on the good TV show front, mm-hmm. there's a Star Wars show called Andor. Another one? Well, there's always a Star oh, Wars. God, show. I can't yeah. keep up with all these shows. Bro. This one is really good, though, Brian. Okay, it's really good. So it's it's a prequel series. Prequel to what? To the movie Rogue One. Star which Wars is a Rogue shoot one. offshoot, right? Which or is something? a prequel to the oh first Star Wars film. This is exhausting. <laughs> I can't keep up with all this. Who has time to keep up with all this? Okay. Well, fair enough. (laughs) So it's so good, though. It's so good because... Okay. Why is it so good? Sell me on it. Okay. So we all know Star Wars and the Empire, right? Empire is big, big evil. Yep. Evil dictatorship. Order 66. That's right. Kicked it all off. So this is kind of like a more more grounded approach to a Star Wars narrative. Oh. There's no Jedis. What? There's no lightsabers. What? None of that. What it's is just, this show? It's about the resistance being born, about the resistance oh. to the empire. So the empire is in hmm. full swing. Planets and star systems are being oppressed mm. under the iron boot of iron boot. Iron boot this sounds ineffective. <laughs> I don't know of the iron <laughs> fist of yeah. Emperor Palpatine, but it's, okay. it, it is more grounded. They are talking about like how how does the empire actually make these people's lives miserable which okay. is something they never really delved into like okay stormtroopers are bad they're trying to kill the good guys ah kill them empire is bad mm-hmm. but you never really see like well why why is this government well, you see the death star like blowing up planets and stuff once, like yeah. that's not good yeah well um, once but you would assume yeah that they're but from wanting like, to do it more sure they're evil they kill people but like this is like from the perspective of regular <laughs> sure, they're evil they regular kill people, regular but, you know. people and how how <laughs> the, okay the the dictatorship is affecting the regular dudes. Okay. And so I appreciate the grounded approach because mm-hmm. I don't think Star Wars has to be all, you know, space battles and lightsabers. And I think that this series is- Which is normally is, what it is. Yeah, yeah exactly. And yeah. I mean, that that's cool, but it yeah. doesn't have to be. So I, I appreciate mm-hmm. the series is doing that. So I'm enjoying that. Shannon okay. could not care less, but uh, yeah, I'm loving it. Because okay. I'm getting my, you know, I, I bring the giant love sack to the middle of the room, get all cozy in it, oh, wow. turn off all the lights. There you go. Nice. Just, just take it in. It's my happy place. That seems that seems like that's very you. Yes, it is, nice. I, I have a cup of coffee. Mm. Oh, that's the best. <laughs> oh, there I'm you also go. replaying Final Fantasy VII remake. Uh, what? <laughs> Final Fantasy VII. Final, Final Fantasy, which they is like, a they made like what, 45 of them or something. Uh, I think they're working 13? on they're working on 16 right now. 16. Well, 16 numbered oh regular gosh. editions, but there have been offshoots too. I cannot keep up with it. What is it with nerd stuff? <laughs> That they're like, we're going to number all these things, but we're not going to do them in order. We're going to go back and forth yeah, in the timeline, do all these offshoots, well, honestly, and make none it of super the, confusing. Only like one of the Final, Final Fantasies is actually a Like sequel. a continuation yeah. of whatever. Okay, yeah. that's fair. Yeah. but So none of them are final, by the way. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. How do you have no, no, more no. than one Final Fantasy? 16 plus. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm replaying that. This one is a remake of what a lot of people consider to be the best Final Fantasy back from 1997. So okay. they redid the whole story, new voice acting, new graphics and everything like that. I've played it once, okay. playing it through a second time. Um, playing it through... Is it like a new remake? Like, yeah. Okay. It's a couple years ago. So not like, oh, like when the Super Mario 2, when they like remade... Because, you know, Super Mario 2 is like different ripped off of another yeah game. yeah, yeah no, like no. it was a remake but it was no just they like just they, they took the story game. they took everything and just like okay. remade the game with nice beautiful updated graphics cool yeah. okay it's been that it's been super that. cool so i've beaten it once before playing it again um with all my original stuff which is kind of mm. making the whole game way too easy so i kind of regret that decision oh because i'm just like 
one hit killing everybody. So yeah, now I'm like, I should have just started it over from scratch. But anyway, hmm. I'm enjoying the story. Okay. But that's basically my nerd world update. All right. That's solid. Solid nerdage. Yep. Gosh, that's so exhausting just to think of all these different <laughs> versions of things. I don't know how you keep up with it. It's I fun. can't retain it. Like this is the stuff that Joseph will come up to me and be like, Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> this stormtrooper and that one and this minifigure has a molded head instead of a double mold. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't care. Like that would really interest me. I'm sure it would. <laughs> you and my you and my 12-year-old son should hang out sometime, Drew. You'd get along really well. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I love my son, but he, you know. Who can keep up with all this? Anyway, I keep up with what I can for his sake. Um, okay, cool. Uh, are you done? Yes. Cool. Good. <laughs> Sorry. This is no reflection on you. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so my stuff. I've been uh, I've been doing some stuff outside. Mm-hmm. Um, so the uh, corduroy road thing that I did to replace my log bridge, I um, took it. It was done, and I made it more done. I made it better. What's the heaviest so, thing you've driven across it yet? Uh, I've driven like a tractor across of it, dude. Yeah. So like, yeah, I can yeah. drive like legitimate vehicles across it. It's basically a road. That's amazing. Yeah. But like, I basically had. You like, should win a prize for that. Well, thank you. The prize is my own satisfaction. I've never built a road, but I like scooped out and basically made like actual like real like ditches because I basically had just like a complete drop off. So that if I like like went off the road part, it was like like a two foot drop into a ditch. Mm-hmm. So I like really made more like swales so that I can like have more of a gentle like you know how when you're driving on the side of like a country road, you'll have like more of a dip instead yeah, of just yeah, like yeah. a sheer drop right, off the road. Right. So I, I needed to do that. Swale. A swale. A swale. Look it up. Swale is a real word. That's a swale a word swale. right there. It's basically a, a gentle ditch. Mm-hmm. Is a like, a, like, a, like a curve, like a ramp? No, it's like it's like a ditch. Like it's like a it's like a, a valley, you know, a very small gentle valley. Usually it's swales are what you see a lot of times on the side of like um like on the interstate. You know, in between your highway, mm-hmm. like the, you know, there's like a big dip and that's where like the water from the roads will kind of go off into the swale yeah, and it'll yeah, carry yeah. it down. Okay. That's a swale. Cool. Yep. You had that to um, avoid erosion. That's what it's for. Anyway, so did that. It was a lot of just moving dirt and stuff like that. That was, uh, honestly, it was pretty awesome because the weather was great and I was living my best life out there. I love that for you. While you were inside, huddled up <laughs> watching movies and playing video games, I mm. was outside in the dirt and getting muddy. Um, so yeah, did all that leaves, 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 leaves are everywhere. Yep. Dealing with lots of leaves. Yep. A couple of weeks ago, I was like, you know, we haven't had that many leaves fall yet. It's probably going to happen. I know it's happened many years before, but it's like, it really doesn't feel like it's happened. And now it's like, oh yeah. Blah, you know, like my favorite thing about down. leaves on the back deck is what's that? Drew? The dogs think that it's the ground. Oh, so that's they fun. Pee on the back deck. They pee and poop all over your deck. They're like, oh, this that's counts. fun. And I'm like, they nope, just like nope. camouflage in. So the I'm leaves. just like, as soon as they get out there, I'm like, no, 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 keep going, nope. keep going, keep going. Go, 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 go. No, 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 no. That's not. Mm. Oh, too bad. That's not the earth. No, they don't know. No, they the don't. Dogs. I, got the ho- I, got, I got the hose ready. They're excited to poo. What are you going to yeah, do? Yeah, they are. Um, let's see here. Continue to play chess with my kids. They're still into it. Loving it. I'm working on Rachel. But um, gotten some, uh, some tips about watching the Queen's Gambit. Oh yeah, that That's chess show. movie. Yeah. yeah, or show, show, show. Yeah. Oh, it's a show. I it was yeah, on Netflix. Um, not very kid friendly, from what I understand. You're gonna kind maybe of... moments of it, so I'll okay. probably like watch it myself. And then you know, it's not like super graphic or anything, from what mm-hmm. I understand. But it's like a more of an adult themed story. Mm-hmm. You know, she's like an orphan and like has some kind of traumatic stuff. Have you ever been to the website so, Common Sense Media? No, I've I not. go there sometimes to check on Marvel movies for Archer because he likes Marvel stuff and Star Wars stuff. And okay. I I go there and they have a breakdown for like profanity like oh. um romance stuff okay. um violence drug yeah. use and stuff. they have like ratings for everything so oh. they, they tell you like what words are said that are bad when they're said and like so yeah. i use i use that to kind of like give myself a baseline okay to like at least say okay this is like a no way like right oh right. deadpool nope not even gonna i'm not even gonna bother <laughs> considering yeah. that one definitely not for um, kids yeah no but then so it might, it, it's a pretty solid website. I'll have for, to check that out. That seems kind of cool. Yeah. yeah, that would be handy. Because my kids are reaching that age where it's like, you know, my son's turning 13, my daughter's 11, but she's a very precocious 11-year-old. Yeah. So they can handle some things, mm-hmm. but other things they can't. Right. So we're in that weird zone. Yeah. So yeah, anyway, I might check that out a little bit, but there we go. Um, and then I've been just doing some stuff in my wood shop, 
just cleaning some stuff up, building some shelving, nothing like super crazy, dramatic, exciting to take pictures of, but you know, just felt motivated. I'm like kind of like a little bit in between projects. Is your fancy shed still clean on the floor? I mean, there's mud all over it, but it's staying relatively clean. All right. You know, mud. Solid? Yeah, it happens. But this time of year, that's the thing, is when it starts to get cold in like fall, just mud happens everywhere. Yeah. So yeah, lots of mud, but I don't know, whatever. I love it. So yeah, just enjoying, enjoying doing stuff. Weather's been solid too. Weather's been pretty solid. Yeah. It is like spontaneously like raining and stuff, which is kind of weird. Yeah. So that makes certain projects kind of interesting, but whatever. Yeah. So I've been doing a lot of just piddly stuff around the house, but enjoying myself. That's about it for me. All right. We got, uh, oh, we got a company update here. Well, Drew, we have not been able to do this for a while. No. Because of COVID things. Big deal. But we are returning to normalcy. I guess this is normalcy. Yes. A costume contest. So we did a yes. little Halloween costume contest. As of the filming of this, we haven't actually done it yet, but we're anticipating that it's going to be awesome. And uh, yeah. So and we'll, we'll share, we'll share some it. pictures with you right now. Yeah. Look, this is our, yeah. look at our costume contest. Woo. Yeah. Now I will be look honest. Look at him. Look I'll, at her. I'll be honest, Drew. I have not planned it as of this point. So I know it's happening in two days. In oh, I'm going to be dressed up. You will be dressed up. I've been. Uh, I, you are been, so prepared. I've been upsetting I, my face for a whole month for this. I will. You'll be impressed with how underwhelming whatever it is that I come up with at the last minute will be. All right. Even I will be surprised because I don't know what it's well, going to be. Well, we're going to have food <laughs> and we're going to dress up. And that's all I care about. Sounds good. We're getting burgers. We are doing burgers. Yeah, man. Halloween Com- burgers. Com- company's getting us some burgers. <laughs> that's right. Man, I'm, that, that sounds great. I don't know why burgers. Yeah, I just, I don't, we love don't burgers. Know. Whatever. Burgers sounds and costumes. Me. Sounds good to me. TCB, baby. Did you know, I hope they still have the pretzel rolls. We're getting Red Robin burgers. Yeah. They have those pretzel buns. I don't think that was part of this. I don't think that was able to be selected. <sighs> that's too bad. Yeah. Those pretzel buns. I would have selected a pretzel bun if make it was on it there. You need to go to Red Robin and make it happen on something. Red Robin's always so busy. Whenever we, we drive it's not by that there. Bad. No, you can order in advance and then you just go pick it up. I don't want to pick it up. If things get soggy. I want to eat there. <laughs> eat in the parking lot. And you always get more fries if you eat there. That is true. You can ask for extra fries. Yeah, I guess I if can. you order it. Yeah. And you take it out. Mm. Anyway, no one cares. Okay. <laughs> Moving on. We're gonna wrap it up. Hey. All right, everybody. Thank you for watching. A shorty today. I mean, sort of, still an hour. But leave us some feedback about how we're doing. Ask us some questions so that we can answer them in future pincasts. Um, check out gooleypins.com. Subscribe to all our things. Email us at pincast at gooleypins.com. And I have a random fact. Drew, last time I talked about yellow jackets. That wasn't fun. This time I'm going to talk about bees. I like bees. This blew my freaking mind when I heard about this. Do tell. Okay. So I listened to a... This is... I'm. Totally just rehashing something I heard on another podcast. That's fine. Um, it's uh, Have you ever heard of Today I Found Out? It's nope. like a YouTube channel, and I think it's called Brain Food. It's like the whatever. Anyway, they have all kinds of random stuff. I like learning random things, so I mm-hmm. consume some of this content. It's a good podcast to listen to while I'm just like doing stuff because it's like, ah, if I'm not as interested, I just kind of whatever, tune it out. But there was some really cool stuff in here about bees. Okay, so it's not about stinging and all that kind of stuff. It's got nothing to do with it. So bees, right? So... On their own, they don't really think about anything. They're not individually that intelligent, right? A bee. It's an insect. Would you say they need a hive mind? Yes. Well, that's like the idea of the hive mind comes into it, right? So like as a collective, the bee hive, like the bee colony, is amazingly complex. Mm -hmm. So I've known this like generally, but there's this one little thing that I kind of learned. There's a bunch of different very cool things about bees you can learn. But one thing that I learned recently that just blew my mind um, and I'm going to share that with you now. So I don't remember like if this is all bees or just a specific species or whatever. So don't fact make, check me on this. Okay. But um, so think about it. Bees. Bees. They have to survive. Like we talked about yellow jackets. They all die. Yep. Right. But bees, they got to keep going. They're making honey. They're doing things. They're making things happen. Right. That's there. So how does the colony keep itself warm when they are not warm blooded creatures? They are cold blooded. So like all other insects, they have to absorb sunlight and that makes their blood warmer and they can do their thing. But they can't like self heat like we do. Like we get under a blanket and we feel warmer. Mm -hmm. That doesn't happen with insects. So what I learned is that bees, they have, you know, ones that serve different roles, right? Like you have the queen pumps out bee babies. Yep. Males impregnates the queen. 
worker bees, they go out, they get honey. Other ones tend to the larvae, all this kind of things. So there's other ones that like guard the entry to the hive. They all have different roles that they serve, which is in itself kind of crazy because they all have like very distinct jobs and they all work together. But I guess it was somewhat recently discovered that one of the ways that bees maintain their hive is that there is a bee, I can't remember the specific name for this job, but they basically are like warming bees, like warmer mm -hmm. bees. So what they do, these bees who have this job, they essentially like take the muscles that they use to flap their wings and they sort of like detach it from their wings. Like the wings, I guess, I don't know if they like fall off their body or whatever, but they like disable their wings and they will basically just frantically flap their wing muscles to create friction to thus warm up their bodies and give off heat. And they do this inside the hive. So that's crazy. They've measured that it makes like a 14 degree increase in their body heat in Fahrenheit, which is like significant. Like if we heated up 14 degrees right now, we would die. Yeah. Like our brains would melt <laughs> basically. Oh my but God. these bees can do this. Not only can they do that, right? So it's like getting crazier. <laughs> Not only can they do that, but they were, you know, scientists were studying these hives and stuff and they would find that there's like all these kind of holes and stuff where they'd like put the larvae in the, in the mm -hmm. honeycomb and stuff. Well, the holes are not an accident. The holes are there so that these warming bees can crawl into these holes, do their warming thing and warm up the larva. It's like a radiator. They're like radiating heat oh. out of there, right? What? Not only that. A bee radiator. How crazy is that? Not only that, but they found that the temperature that these larvae are kept can help to determine what jobs they're going to be suited for, for when they hatch. And then they're like healthier for some things or others. So that like, so not only can they lay the larvae into the honeycomb to strategically place them and these warming bees will go into these holes and heat them up. But depending on what the needs of the hive are, they can space out or get together more of these warming bees around the larvae to affect essentially like how the larvae will develop into the workers that will then like be ready for future parts of the hive. Isn't that insane? That is very insane. How the heck like that blows my mind. And none of them are like individually thinking about no. any of this. This is just like somehow happening with the whole collective hive, just blew my mind when I heard about this. I was like, dang. That's freaking nuts. Yellow jackets, y'all need to suck it. Just a bunch of murders. Y'all need to be bees. Bees got it going on. Yellow jackets are just Yellow jackets messing are everything worst. up. Ruining everything. <laughs> killing bees too. They're killing bees. The worst. They kill anything. They're just monsters. Disgusting. Anyway, bees are cool. Bees so are cool. They still terrify my kids though, because they all look the same, but oh, yeah. whatever. Bees are, bees are rad. So that's my fun fact for That today. is a fun fact. Isn't that crazy? That is a fun fact. There's even crazier stuff about bees oh, if yeah. you, this podcast is but anyway, that's what I got for you today. Be facts. Think that'll do it. Anyway, hope you all enjoyed this one. We'll catch you on the next one. And right on. <laughs>